Okay, so the topic of this presentation is going to be some of the basic chemistry behind water. Let's go ahead and get started. So one of the more defining features of water is that it's a polar molecule. And this means that one part of the molecule has a positive charge while the other has a negative charge. Now you know the formula for water is H2O. So there's an O for oxygen. On the periodic table, oxygen has eight protons and also means it has eight electrons. And therefore they kind of cancel out and you have no charge. I'm gonna draw the eight electrons of oxygen. There's gonna be two electrons in level one and six electrons in the second level. Now water is also made from hydrogen atoms. And so I'm gonna add one to hydrogen atoms. Hydrogen has one proton in its nucleus and then one electron in its outer level. So by themselves, all three of these atoms are unstable, but they also have no charge, all three of them. However, when water forms, the two hydrogens will bond with the oxygen. So now that the atoms have bonded, let's focus our attention on the red oxygen atom. What we're gonna see is that it really hogs the blue electrons of hydrogen. Let me go ahead and put the red electrons in motion. And what happens is the oxygen atom will actually kind of take the blue hydrogen electrons. And by doing so, this is how oxygen becomes negatively charged. It has eight protons, but it has 10 electrons giving it a negative charge. And this is how the blue hydrogen atoms become positively charged. The blue hydrogens still have their one proton, but they don't have any electrons, making them positive. And you can see we've fulfilled the definition of what it means to be polar, one part positive, one part negative. So let me freeze the electrons and remind us that a covalent bond is when the involved atoms share electrons. An ionic bond is where one atom takes electrons from another. You might think this is an ionic bond because it looks like oxygen is taking electrons from the hydrogen atoms. However, we're gonna see it's a covalent bond because every now and then a couple of electrons will orbit around the hydrogen on the right. And every now and then a couple of electrons will orbit around the hydrogens on the left. But most of the time the electrons are orbiting around the oxygen. So the definition of covalent bonds is fulfilled because they do share electrons, it's just not shared equally. So here's a simpler picture of a water molecule bonding with another water molecule. And they bond in by what's called a hydrogen bond here. You see why they bond? Positive hydrogen is attracted to negative oxygens. And when we add more water molecules, you can see a bunch of hydrogen bonds are forming, which hold polar water molecules together. So here's a layer of water molecules and what's underneath them are more water molecules. Again, positive con connected to negatives. And what's underneath layer number two is layer number three. Underneath layer three, well, it depends on how deep the water is, but notice how the molecules are arranged positive to negative because water is polar. So because water is polar, there's a few other characteristics. One being that water has a high specific heat. And what this means is that it will resist changing temperatures. It's not impossible to change the temperature of water. You can boil it, of course. It just takes a lot of energy to break the hydrogen bonds. So here's a pot filled with water. And if we add a flame underneath, over time, what happens is these hydrogen bonds begin to be, uh, to be broken and the water begins to evaporate. But because water has a high specific heat, it just takes a lot of energy to break these bonds. Eventually they're broken and the water evaporates. So this is actually a really good thing, water having a high specific heat, because this helps to maintain our constant internal body temperature. You know, the mass of our bodies is mostly water. And even during strenuous activity, like the athletes in this picture, our, our body temperature hardly changes. We've all had moments where we've had a fever and we felt miserable and we've been ill and sick and we don't feel very well. Well, what's going on there? Well, when our normal body temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, well, we have proteins in our body and here's a protein, protein X. But in an elevated temperature, the protein begins to denature and unravel. And so when our body temperature becomes too high or too low, proteins within our body start to break down 
and therefore our cells lose the ability to perform whatever function those proteins are responsible for, and it could lead to some of the, the ill effects that we feel when we're sick. So maintaining a constant internal body temperature is really important. It's a good thing we're mostly made from water. So another characteristic of water is that it has cohesion. And because water's polar, it will be attracted to other water molecules that are also polar. You know, the paper clip that you see in this picture, it's not actually floating. Let's explore this. So here's uh, our, our water, and let me add a paper clip. And if I were to ask you, why is this paper clip able to stay atop the water? It's not that really that it's floating. It's just that the paper clip isn't heavy enough to break those hydrogen bonds that we talked about earlier that are connecting one water molecule with another water molecule. For the same reason that you see in this picture, water strider are insects that can skip across the surface of water here. You can actually see where the legs of the insect come in contact with the water. The water is kind of flexing and bending underneath the weight of the insect. The insect is just not heavy enough to break those hydrogen bonds. But because water is polar, it will attract with other water molecules. And that's what cohesion means. So because water is polar, it also has adhesion. And this is where polar water molecules are attracted to substances other than water. Here's a graduated cylinder filled with water. Notice the curvature right there. That's known as the meniscus when you add water into a graduated cylinder. Now the bottom of the meniscus might read 25 milliliters and the top might read, let's say, 29. Well, how much water is inside of this graduated cylinder? Do you read the top or the bottom? In order to be accurate, you always read the bottom of the meniscus, 25 milliliters. But the point is, why is there a meniscus in the first place? Well, that's because water is polar and it's attracted to the inside of the graduated cylinder. Again, this is just another good example of how water has adhesion. So changing topics, I want to mention that water is one part of a solution. You might know a solution is simply a mixture where one substance can dissolve within another. Now solutions tend to have two parts to them. One part being a solvent, and this is going to be the watery part. So the solvent is the part of a solution that actually causes things to dissolve. And the things that dissolve are called solutes. We'll talk about them in a moment. And water is typically the universal solvent. And the other part of a solution are, are called the solutes that I just mentioned a moment ago. Solutes are the parts that actually dissolve. And so if you put sugars into water, the sugars are going to dissolve. Salts will dissolve when you put them in water. Nutrients will dissolve when you put them in water. So here's a beaker of water. Let me add some sugar and some maybe strawberry Kool-Aid powder. And which makes sense? Statement A, sugar dissolves in water. Or B, water dissolves in sugar. Statement A should make sense. The sugar in the Kool-Aid is going to dissolve within the water because the sugar are the solutes. The, the Kool-Aid is the solutes and the water is the solvent. So a great example of a biological solution is blood. Now here's a test tube filled with blood and there's a stopper on top. And if we put it in a centrifuge, which is a machine that spins it really fast, it will separate into these layers. The bottom layer being red blood cells, the middle layer being white blood cells and platelets, and the beige liquid on top, this is blood plasma. Plasma, which is mostly made up of water. That makes plasma the solvent portion of a solution. And suspended within that plasma are solutes, such as sugars and proteins and salts. So blood, again, just a really nice example of a biological solution made up of solute and solvent. So let's change topic for a moment and talk about the pH scale, something you might remember from middle school. This scale ranges between 0 to 14. You might remember everything below a 7 is an acid. Everything above a 7 is a base. And if something has a pH of exactly 7, it's neutral. And this is really the, the pH of water. But what does the pH scale actually measure? It measures the, the concentration of hydrogen ions that are within a solution. This is a little backwards here, but acids actually, uh, the, the smaller the number, tend to have more hydrogen ions. And therefore, the bases, even though they have the bigger numbers, have fewer hydrogen ions. Well, bases actually have a lot of another kind of ion known as hydroxides, and acids have very few hydroxides. Now, what makes an acid or a base strong is really the distance from neutral. The farther you go from neutral, the stronger the acid becomes. And for a base, the farther you go from neutral, the stronger the base becomes. 
So if I add these solutions right here and these questions, take a moment, pause the video, try to answer these. I'm going to go over the answers in three, two, one. So number one, which base has the most hydrogen ions? I hope you said, well, that's blood. Even though um, blood has a pH of about 7.5, 7.6, it's the, uh, the farthest base that's to the left on this scale. Number two, what substance has the fewest hydrogen ions? Well, from the six that I gave you, it would be ammonia because it's farthest to the right. It's the stronger of the bases. And then no, uh, number three, which of these is the strongest acid? Well, there's only three acids, lemons, soft drinks, and milk. The strongest acid is lemons. It's the smallest number, but it's further from neutral. So here's a couple beakers of water. Let's go into acids and bases in a little more detail. Acids first. If I were to drop a block of substance A into the beaker on the left, and over time substance A dissolves and releases hydrogen ions, this would form an acidic solution. On the right hand side, focus on the bases. If I drop a block of substance B and it slowly dissolves and releases hydroxides, this would be characteristic of an alkaline or a basic solution. So let's connect the pH scale to, to life. Maintaining our pH inside of our bodies is critical. Blood has a pH of about 7.4, which is a, a weak base. And here we have two side-by-side -side tables here. When our proteins are exposed to the normal pH of blood, they maintain their shape, and these proteins can perform a variety of functions in our cells. But when exposed to abnormal pH, either too high or too low, proteins begin to denature, and then we lose whatever process these proteins are a part of. So maintaining the, the internal balance, like our pH, is, is crucial to our survival. So one action that can actually alter the pH of our blood is through alcohol abuse. Alcohol poisoning can lower the pH because as alcohol builds up, hydrogen ions build up in the person's bloodstream. This alters the normal 7.4 pH found within their bloodstream. And when, uh, if protein X is supposed to maintain this shape, but because of the lower than normal pH now, it denatures and begins to unravel, again, this protein performs a function, and as the protein unravels, this, this function is now lost. Now, hopefully, your kidneys will remove these extra hydrogen ions, and maybe the worst thing that happens is you wake up with a little bit of a headache if you've ever drank too much, too much alcohol. But unfortunately, with people who abuse alcohol, often there's uh, kidney damage, and so they have a hard time regulating this balance. So as I wrap up this video, here's a practice quiz that you can try to check your understanding. Hope you found this video helpful, and thanks for watching.